2022. Uh, so we're really excited to be here and I'm very excited for this conversation that um, we're, we're going to be part of um, and listening to uh, coming up. But again, welcome everybody. Um, we I just wanted to introduce very briefly um, Generations Working Together, um, who is the, I mean, it's the nationally recognised centre of excellence, um, supporting the development and integration of intergenerational work across Scotland. And this year, I guess we really wanted to open that out um, and celebrate um, our International Women's Day this year. Um, I guess just appreciating all the different elements um, of intergenerational work and, you know, that, that um, I guess the diversity and the importance of many of the themes that we experience and come across intersecting. So uh, we have two amazing women um, who are um, going to share a conversation with us uh, this evening. Um, we had to be recorded earlier, um, obviously in, in terms of um, aligning busy schedules, but also international time zones. So it is a very international conversation as well. Um, bringing together Cockab Stewart, MSP for Glasgow Kelvin and Zara Al Halali. Um, who um, will introduce each in turn very briefly. Um, but just to introduce the faces in the room to begin with, um, we have Kate Samuels with us from GWT um, as Communications and Policy Officer. Um, behind the scenes, we've got Bella Kerr um, keeping us ticking as Intergenerational Development Officer. And we've got Alison Clyde with us today, who's our Chief Executive Officer. Um, and my name's Jude Curry. I'm a trustee with GWT. Um, and in my day-to-day -day job, I'm a social worker. Um, so I'm really, really keen to, to hear this conversation as well. Um, I'm very passionate about it. So uh, this is part of our conference and the theme, obviously, we're building an intergenerational nation. Um, and this is part of that. Uh, and this is the first time we're doing this to celebrate Women's Day. And I suppose for me, it's really important, I think, um, to acknowledge the sphere of influence of, I guess, little and large events in the world on women. Um, but also the influence of women in the world. And I think it's a really valued and valuable part um, or theme to discuss today. Um, so a, a little on the theme of in International Women's Day. Uh, this year it is Break the Bias. Um, so you might have seen this kind of um, symbol. Um, so I really encourage people to tweet in general for those that, you, um, that, do, that do use Twitter. We've got a number of handles to promote. We've got um, hashtag GWT webinars, which you'll see on the screen. And um, we've got um, hashtag intergenerational, well, I suppose a little plug for intergenerational week, um, which I'll talk about a little more at the end, but also um, hashtag Break the Bias. Um, as well. So please do use those and International Women's Day 2022. So um, another thing to point out is our chat bar. So you'll see, obviously this is a webinar format, but um, we want to hear and encourage people's thoughts and conversations as we go. So please do use that. Um, we'll try and pick up some questions and comments along the way, just to reflect on at the end. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our, our speakers. Um, which I could spend a long time doing, um, but I'm going to try and be quite succinct so we can get stuck in. But we have um, Zara Al-Halali. Um, so she's currently a 21-year-old law and journalism student, and she's in her penultimate year at Murdoch University in Australia. And she has aspirations to work within policy. So she sits as a non-executive board director of a new international affairs NGO called Missing Perspectives. Um, and that's amplifying the voices of young people across media and journalism. She has a whole host of other involvements um, and is, a, for example, a consultant funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation at UN Women uh, NYC. And she continues, yep, yeah, there to, um, I guess, promote and further the Generation Equality Campaign, which we'll hopefully hear more about um, in her thoughts. Uh, and she is the current chair of the Youth Ministerial Advisory Council in the Department of Communities at Home. So she's obviously very international and very focused on the, the communities and areas around her. Um, she is also on lots of advisory bodies, including the Young Women's Council of Australia and the MYAN Australia Youth. Um, which is obviously multicultural youth advocacy 
um, and it's the Ambassador Network as well. So as a result of her work, um, she's been named as a finalist at, um, for Young Woman of the Year in 2020 and is one, in 20, one of 25 young women to watch in international affairs and the inaugural winner of Under 25's Rising Star for the 40 Under 40 Asian Australian Leadership Awards. I mean, that's a lot to pack in, um, absolutely. And it's a real privilege to be able to, to, be able to have her as part of um, our conversation and part of our conference. And we also have Cockab Stewart, MSP, as I said, for Glasgow Kelvin, for the Scottish National Party. Mm -hmm. um, so she, I believe, is a primary school teacher for over 30 years. And during that time has been a trade union representative and a political activist on equalities, social justice issues and Scottish independence. So Cockab is a deputy convener for the Education, Children and Young People Committee. Um, and an Equalities, Human Rights and Civil Justice Committee member. So I believe this is the first time, Alison, correct me if I'm wrong, that they will have met each other. So it's often um, the first time we've probably been in a room together um, like this. Um, and obviously it's the first time we're hearing this conversation and myself included. So um, we'll pick up maybe some reflections at the end. So please do um, uh, think and share your thoughts as we go and at the end um, and I see Kate has very helpfully put in some bios on the edge as well just so you get more of a sense of it because I couldn't possibly do it justice here so um, I think without further ado I'm just gonna um, introduce uh, the, the video if we can um, but thanks everyone for being here. Hi Zara, um, it's lovely to meet you. Um, I'm Cocab Stewart, um, I'm MSP for Glasgow Kelvin and today I'm speaking to you from uh, my constituency in Glasgow Kelvin. It's lovely to meet you. Lovely to meet you as well, the privilege and pleasure is all mine. <laughs> so we're here today um, as part of Generations Working Together on International Women's Day um, and obviously the celebrations going on um, across the world. Um, so why do you think that it's important um, to uh, celebrate International Women's Day? Yeah, so I think I should first of all introduce myself to give a gist of my platform and advocacy as a young woman of colour in Australia. Um, so my name is Zara Al-Hilali and I am a first generation Australian to refugee and migrant parents from Palestine and Iraq. Um, I do quite a lot of advocacy on the grassroots and national level in Australia. I'm working across gender equality reforms, specifically regarding how we can adopt intersectional representation on the highest level of governance. Um, which reflects all the way down to grassroots levels. Um, fundamentally to myself, I believe that International Women's Day is a great opportunity to reflect grassroots voices that unfortunately have not been platformed and amplified um, across spaces that don't traditionally reflect um, a variety of intersectional voices. International Women's Day acts as a beacon of hope um, for so many young women, especially young women of color, um, to see themselves being represented and to speak out and speak loud of the um, opportunities and the grassroots advocacy that they do um, to essentially build back a world and build back that community of developing an equitable future. You're so uh, right there, Sarah. Uh, two words that sort of jumped out at me there is um, uh, intersectionality, um, which is something that um, I've always tried to campaign on. Um, I, I have the privilege, I suppose, of uh, being the first woman of colour uh, to be elected to the Scottish Parliament. Um, but you might be aware that I first stood in 1999, actually. Um, and to be honest, I, I didn't think that it would be me. Um, I mean, about five or six years ago uh, I started uh, mentoring and coaching and trying to bring on um, young women such as yourself to be the next generation um, however here we are you know uh, did get elected um, so the grassroots very much um, encouraging uh, from the grassroots up uh, I think International Women's Day uh, gives us an opportunity to sort of highlight uh, role models um, however for some of us, we've not had those role models. 
hospitals. Um, so somebody of my age um, who is sort of coming through the system and has come through, I'm still on my journey. Um, I didn't have the, the uh, women of color role models um, within politics, certainly, and actually education. I was a teacher for almost 30 years. And whilst there were lots of learning assistants that are teachers um, uh, in schools rather, and teachers, um, what I didn't see was women in positions of leadership uh, that were of colour, and yet teaching is female dominated. Um, so you're, you're, uh, it's interesting, you know, the work that you do on that advocacy and amplifying the voices um, on uh, a world stage, I suppose. Um, what challenges do you think that women face today? Because I'd be interested to hear that from your point of view. Yeah, look, I think, um, first of all, I do want to touch on the fact that in Australia, International Women's Day is almost over for us. And, you know, speaking to you about representation and diversity made me reflect on the day and what it looked like to many young Australian women of colour. I'm going to be completely honest with you. I'm disappointed this year once again for International Women's Day. And I think that that also extends to... Um, the challenges that we're facing within the gender equality advocacy space. Unfortunately, um, and I'm sure this is a global um, profound notion that is found in many Western countries, the gender equality space is predominantly um, led by um, white feminists. Mm -hmm. um, completely disappointed this year, once again, to see the lack of representation being amplified within the highest spaces that celebrate um, gender equality today and I think that today was meant to be a day for hope it was meant to be a day where we amplify the most neglected constituents within um, ad the advocacy space it's a space where we create room and we open those doors but unfortunately um, myself sitting here today I'm once again disappointed by the lack of uh, representation which brings me to the next point of some of the challenges we're facing in um, the gender equality advocacy space and that is fundamentally the lack of opportunities for um, intersectional women now that extends to intersectional young women all the way to intersectional old women um, I think that unfortunately the gender equality advocacy space isn't as inclusive at the current moment and I think that whilst reflecting about your own experiences, it worries me because I've only been in this space for five years and I've seen little progress. Um, it is quite disappointing to be frank. And I think that there is so much to do. And unfortunately I'm slowly, and I often do challenge um, and struggle with that challenge of realizing that the World Economic Forum, forums um, uh, statistic that gender equality won't be achieved in the next 99 years unfortunately might be true. Yeah, um, I'm reflecting on what you said, I, I, I totally understand uh, your disappointment um, and it has been my eternal frustration as well. Um, and when I reflect on why did it take uh, 21 years to get the first woman of colour elected? Why, why did that happen? Um, and it's the, the multiple barriers and the intersectional barriers. Uh, what I found was that everyone else uh, thought that everyone else was supporting me. Uh, uh, the because I was female, uh, the men uh, one they guard their spaces, so the, you know it's difficult in politics anyway, and then the men carve those out, and that's that. Um, and they just assumed that I would be getting support from women. Uh, the women saw me as a woman of colour, uh, so they saw the race first and they thought, well, you know, she doesn't really necessarily need our support because she will get that from within her own communities, whereas within my own communities to have a Pakistani woman. Uh, wanting to be in mainstream politics was actually for the reserve of men. So from every level, <laughs> I really felt as though, you know, I had fallen down the cracks in that way. Um, and yes, 
So the expectations were never uh, that I would ever succeed, that this was always going to be a campaigning issue. Um, and don't get me wrong, there were points of that journey where I did feel like absolutely giving up, because um, I'll go back to the role model thing, is that um, just examples, uh, uh, you know, cross party, as well as within many communities, was that there, there just wasn't anybody like me. Um, and one of the things, I do have hope though, um, because I think, well, I'm now in a space and that space for me is very much shared. Um, mm -hmm. And it's to make sure that I am that woman that, you know, now that I've opened the door a little bit, because let's face it, you're right, it isn't wide open, absolutely no way. But now that it's opened a little bit, that the, the younger generations coming up behind don't have to wait 21 years, because mm -hmm. frankly, the planet cannot afford that, um, let alone every other aspect of our sort of living. Um, What's your opinion about sort of like, you know, I, I, I'm i sort of like, you know, at 54, here I am being elected for the first time, and there's five, five year parliamentary terms, and you know, you being a young woman, um, how can intergenerational conversations uh, help to speed up the, the process towards equal representation that is also intersectional? Yeah, look, I think First and foremost, gender equality can't be achieved if we're not all a part of that revolution. Every single voice needs to be a part of that movement. And we can't complete it overnight with one specific identity, one specific demographic. We all need our own voice to be a part of that train, to push for that movement. And I think that intergenerational dialogue is a key factor to achieving that goal. I think young women come with so much innovation, so much new strategy so much perspective. And I think on the opposing end, so do um, older feminists as well. For me, I think that this is a wonderful, innovative platform that we can both profit off of to reach the common goal of achieving the end result, that revolution that we are after. I've been a part of so many intergenerational dialogues and I always come out expecting as a young woman, I am quite biased. I always come out expecting that I will gain the most from my fellow sisters who are like me, who hold the similar perspectives to myself. But I often shock myself because it is always a new adventure for myself to look for those new strategies that I can implement on the grassroots levels. I think that young, younger and older feminists definitely have paved the way um, for where I am today. But I also want to touch base on my ancestral knowledge that taps into my gender equality advocacy as well. Um, for me, when I think of intergenerational dialogue, I also think about um, as far as my ancestors who aren't alive on this earth today. To me, the reason why I do what I do is because of the women that have come before me and have paved my journey here on this earth today. I am a um, proud Palestinian Iraqi young woman and um, my mom who is Palestinian, I hold a lot of my strength and courage and advocacy to her. She came from a fierce generation of advocates um, fighting against colonization, fighting against uh, the imperialism of their homes, of their culture. And I reflect on their strength and their courage from generations dating back to voices that I've never heard, voices that I've never met. And I think about those stories that I've passed on and have trickled through to my very own mother who are now said to me today, that is why I am here. That is why I speak. That is why I fight. And I think that intergenerational dialogue cannot be, you know, the traditional, I'm speaking to you, you're speaking to me. It extends to the voices that are why we do what, I, what we do. They are our courage. They are our strength. And I think that intergenerational dialogue is not those that are living. It is those voices that you know, have pushed us to continue to live. Uh, Zara, that's such a sort of um, evocative way of looking at it. And that has certainly inspired me, um, you know, to sort of reflect on my space within that intergenerational um, conversation. Um, I've often despaired in the past that, you know, we, we have had trailblazers sort of, um, you know, ahead of us, um, but yet we've made such little progress. So, 
you know, there is a disconnect there. And I do think that uh, those conversations and the lessons um, and the mistakes, um, you know, quite clearly there are ways of campaigning. Um, and I would, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that, you know, I always think that education um, and, you know, stats and lived experiences underpin um, our arguments uh, going forward. Uh, but also to, sort of like, you know, to look at the past and the history of where we've come. But, uh, you know, when I try to do research and things, um, and when you look up sort of inspirational women from the past, it's it's quite far down the, the research Google sort of agenda before you come across black women. Um, mm -hmm. So it's actually, you know, the high hits are, are not, you know, you have to search quite hard, um, but nevertheless, you know, learning the lessons of the past, but taking stock of the present as well. Um, and for me, certainly, um, the journey is hard and it continues to be difficult. So um, from that point of view, uh, the hope and the drive and the ambition from um, the younger voices actually gives me more power to my elbow. And you're right about the innovation. Um, I mean, social media is one of these uh, things that certainly, um, you know, that's been drawn to my attention to use that as a tool to amplify voices as well, which I necessarily wouldn't have considered um, in the past. Um, but I suppose sort of like uh, for our audiences um, that are out there, uh, you know, listening to this, um, you know, the questions that come to my mind is um, what can be done to make that intergenerational dialogue more impactful? Because I do feel that we are speaking to each other um, and listening, but is that enough? What is the next step to actually, you know, not just be concerned about the inputs, but what are the outputs? You know, how, how can we actually make that change? where are the pressure points that we are not managing to put our finger on? Maybe maybe that's something that uh, we could sort of, you know, food for thought in that sense. Um, so do you think that, I mean, I said earlier that I'd open the door a wee bit of a crack um, and people refer to it as a glass ceiling. Whereas I've often said that it's not just a glass ceiling, it's actually a glass door, it is glass walls. And sometimes it's a glass floor as well. You, you, you know, the barriers come at you from every direction. Um, so, but do you think that we've made any progress there? Do you think that uh, the glass ceiling is being broken? Look, I think you're right in the sense that maybe it's a glass room. I, I definitely agree with you on that sentiment, but I think sometimes we also need to look at the broader picture. Are more diverse women actually in that room to get the opportunity to break those glass doors, ceilings, walls? And I think that's something that I often reflect on because it's time to actually start bringing more diverse women who have been left out of that opportunity to break those glass ceilings, to be a part of that movement. Unfortunately, um, upon my reflection, I think that the gender equality advocacy space has been exclusive, but I definitely do see quite a bit of progress over the past couple of years. We're slowly starting to have those important discussions about inclusivity and diversity. I think both of which are two puzzle pieces that connect into one. And I think that those conversations are absolutely important to slowly shift that trajectory of creating more opportunities for um, diversity of women who haven't been a part of that revolution. So the fact that we are having those conversations is absolutely important. That's the first step to creating room. Um, I think it does quite get frustrating when you are consistently having those conversations, but you're seeing limited change. Um, however, I think you're right. You can't necessarily open that glass door in one night. It is going to take quite a while. And I think that I would love to be on earth when we stop having these conversations about opening that door, breaking those glass ceilings. Because you know what? I'm sure just like yourself, we don't want to be having these webinars about how, what we can do to create um, change and create more opportunities. I want there to be more opportunity. I want us to get to that point where we stop having 
these conversations that continuously seem to be, you know, swept under the rug or make that minuscule chip in the door that we are trying to break. Um, look, I think opportunities are slowly being created and mentorship is definitely a big part of it. Um, you spoke about role models and I think with the evolution of slowly seeing more women of color, more diversity within those role models, we're slowly creating more opportunities as well for more diversities to consistently see themselves reflected in the highest level of leadership and governance. Yeah, I think that sort of, um, I think people don't uh, often get the complexities that, you know, uh, as women of color, um, you know, we come from different countries, we, you know, have different experiences. Um, and yet on one level, um, you know, just by skin tone, we might look very similar. And what I find is that, um, I'm expected to be the voice of all black women. And I find that very challenging. And I said, no, you know, I have my own experiences and my own culture and heritage that has informed me, but we cannot be treated like a homogenous group. So although we're, you know, looking at gender equality, um, alongside that is also the cultural diversity of women of color that they bring mm. um, and some of those hurdles can come from within our own cultures as well um, so we're we're sort of battling with those and trying to overcome those um, but also in a predominantly white-led sort of world as well um, and I mean, I do know that some uh, some women ha have struggled very, very hard to get to where they are and all their energies have been spent on carving out that space or that opportunity for them, that some of them are just exhausted by that and take up all their energies by just protecting that space for themselves, um, that they don't have the time to actually look behind them or look forward. Mm -hmm. So I suppose sort of like, I'd be interested, you know, again, sort of like a, a message for the audience is that, uh, you know, although we are campaigners, we are outspoken, we both have platforms, that actually we, we are women and we also have uh, families, we also have our health and well-being, our mental capacities, our, you know, just as rounded human beings, there is a limit. So uh, from that point of view, the message is uh, the more that join uh, the, the voices, you know, the not only amplifying talking more loudly, but also listening more loudly mm. as well. I think that that is important. So perhaps that's something that could be discussed is how do people listen more loudly instead of just being passive recipients of you know, being entertained by the two of us speaking together. But I would challenge people, what are you gonna take away from this? What behaviors are you going to change? Um, because we all have a role to play in that, don't we, um, in that sense. Um, so I suppose sort of like we've talked already a little bit about what different generations can learn from each other. Um, is, there an, is there anything else that you can reflect on that um, with us speaking over the last few minutes and raising some other points about diversity within diversity? Um, and being aware of cultural and historical heritage as well as the future yeah look i think um you touched on some great points there and i think unfortunately especially as women and i think this probably affects us quite a bit more as women of color but there is this perception that there can only be one of us in spaces that holds room for women of color or holds room for women in general um, being a profound and prominent Muslim woman of colour in Australia, a young Muslim woman of colour, I've often, you know, faced that challenge of recognising that I am not the voice of young women of colour. I'm not the voice of Muslim young women of colour. I need to consistently create room for women of colour to share their own stories on their own means. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm often, like yourself, expected to take this role where I represent an entire demographic. 
I am not that representation that many organizations, many media corporations look for. I can't speak on behalf of an entire religion or entire culture. And I think that we consistently need to abolish this concept that number one, that there isn't enough room for every single one of us. But number two, that we are the representation of an entire demographic. The both notions have been completely harmful to my advocacy as well. I remember in my early years of my advocacy, I definitely did hold the concept that I am quite embarrassed of today, that I do represent voices that aren't being amplified by the, by the media. And I think it's only been over the last couple of years that I've slowly started to realize that instead of speaking up and speaking loudly and representing those voices that aren't being told. I need to create that room for those voices to tell their own stories as well. Mm. Because I'm not that representation and I'm taking up space on my own count. And I am doing exactly what I have been advocating for to create space, to create room for women like myself. But Look, I think it's completely selfish and I think many of us do often battle with that concept of do I take up space or do I pass on an opportunity and especially as women of colour where there aren't many opportunities, they're very scarce. Mm. What do you do in that position? Um, and I am slowly starting to, you know, find my own path and my own trajectory on what to do when opportunities do come up. But it's quite funny because when I do reflect on other women, such as white women um, within Australia. I've, and sp speaking to many feminists, I often find that many of them don't really struggle with this concept. So that imposter syndrome element also ties into my advocacy work as well, which is quite, you know, difficult as a young woman navigating my way from number one, avoiding doxing online, but number two, creating space. Um, I do know what you mean. Um, your question is quite a good one about, uh, you know, do, do you use that space to the best of your ability um, or do you sort of vacate it occasionally? Um, my, my advice uh, would be that actually there is space for both um, and nothing bad happens, actually. Uh, you don't miss out. You may have sort of missed out on that particular uh, platform for that 30 minutes, but what you have done is amplifies somebody else's voice for that 30 minutes and what it also does is that it allows you um, to sort of uh, recalibrate uh, for your next challenge as well so that's what I found but I've learned that the hard way I have to say um, is to do that um, it builds more camaraderie um, and it brings that intersectionality together as well um, see when I first got elected obviously um, it was headline news um, you know the uh, big breakthrough had happened and we got uh, you know great iconic pictures with the first minister and it was all very uh sort of uh you know it was great i did find it rather overwhelming i have to say um being a, te a teacher for 30 years and you know having came campaigned extensively on um, education issues and equality issues. Uh, none of that was important. It was just the headline, you know, first women of color. And I was inundated with media requests um, and it was all about the same thing. Um, and what was interesting was that nobody was very interested in the fact that I had been elected for a five year term. And what was my opinion on education policy? What was my opinion on housing policy? And housing is a huge issue in the constituency that I I live in. Um, you know, I, I, my opinions on climate change, for instance, and the fact that we were going to be hosting COP26 in Glasgow in my constituency uh, were somehow totally irrelevant. Um, and I made the very, very difficult decision uh, not to give any interviews um, after the immediate aftermath of my election, unless it was about policy issues. And you won't be surprised to know that there were no media inquiries asking for me to speak on anything else, um, which was quite interesting. Um, I mean, that's changed now. Um, now, I suppose I'm 10 months into the job and I am getting uh, other, you know, uh, sort of opportunities to speak on that but it does give you an example of how you get pigeonholed and although on the one hand people love a human interest story it is then moving beyond that and looking at us as women of color with expertise in policy areas mm -hmm. um, because we are the fabric 
uh, part of the fabric of society and um, housing, uh, immigration, climate change, transport policy. Those are very important points for us. And actually a lot of those impact um, ethnic minority communities um, quite severely. You know, uh, there are additional sort of barriers um, that we have in that. So I would be interested to hear your view on that. Is that the same sort of thing that happens in Australia? Um, you know, black women get asked to talk about sort of uh, the obvious sort of issues or are they more involved in mainstream policy affecting that? Yeah, look, I think exact same thing happens here. And unfortunately, it's quite disappointing and it does get very tedious. I think um, reflecting on my own, you know, media opportunities that I've received, I was slowly thinking about it whilst you were talking about your own experience. And I think I don't have one article that doesn't tie in my cultural diversity. And you know that growing up, I was I often felt alienated. I often felt like I wasn't a woman, you know? I, I felt like me being a Muslim woman was completely bizarre for the Australian community. I faced so much discrimination. I had my hijab ripped off numerous times. My religion was completely discriminated by so many people in my life. And I, I don't even think I've ever slowly, you know, felt like I belong to the woman in gender, in our fight for gender equality. I almost felt like an alien half the time. Um, and, you know, growing up and having a space in places of advocacy like gender equality, I think I've slowly started to find my own voice and acknowledge my own identity. But I think that on, upon reflection, and I think it's quite crazy because this is probably the first time that it's happened to me um, in this webinar, I've slowly started to realise that my identity often is the only reason I'm a part of a space. It's not my expertise, it's not my voice, it's not my passion, it's my identity. It's the fact that I wear a hijab, it's the fact that I'm a woman of colour. And mm. it definitely is quite disappointing because I know I've struggled in, in places of employment, of opportunity, of receiving um, awards or scholarships where I often question whether I'm an appropriate um, candidate of such or whether it's because of my identity and you know that 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 element does really affect you and I think that it does go a very um, long way in you know tearing your self-esteem as well am I really here because I am a strong advocate or am I here because of my identity because of the way that I look Mm -hmm. um, I, I've sort of, you know, on reflection, I think that we hold multiple identities, um, but unfortunately, um, we are seen through people's single vision lenses. Um, and that that's the unfortunate thing is that other people cannot process that we have multiple identities that are informed by our experiences, our culture, our color, our gender, um, you, you know, uh, all, all of those things come into it. Um, and uh, it does make, and we, aren't we good at switching between all of those? Because they actually make up us as whole women. And I, I, I get a lot of confidence from that. But for a period of time, um, because of the pigeonholes, and people find it difficult to put me in a pigeonhole, um, because at times I wear Western clothes, what are perceived as Western clothes. Uh, other times I wear a shalvar kameez. Um, and I mix between the two. And I never thought it was a thing, um, but now that I'm, because it's part of me, both, both aspects are part of me. Um, and at the parliament, uh, what's interesting was that when I wore shalvar kameez there, um, people did comment on it as if I was wearing a sort of fancy dress of some sort, whereas actually it was just work clothes. You know, it was a work plain shalvar kameez sort of outfit that I was wearing. Um, but what I did notice was that um, young people who uh, watch uh, the parliamentary debates and things, uh, they were noticing 
that it was becoming normalized that they were seeing somebody in parliament who wasn't making a big deal out of it was just standing up making a speech uh wearing shilvar kameez uh reflecting a part of their identity and it was normalized it wasn't even referred to so i deliberately now make sure that i wear you know sort of like well i did anyway but i, I pursue that aim of exposing people to the multiple identities and making sure that they're familiar and they're okay with it but hey you know if they're not i am <laughs> in that sense <laughs> so um you know the generations working together have sort of brought us together and it, this is just wonderful to have this chat with you i'm learning so much from your perspectives here um what can uh generations working together do to encourage more inter uh intergenerational dialogue on the topic of gender equality um is is there a, i mean this is a fantastic thing but what else could they do let's put some pressure on them <laughs> yeah look i've worked in the highest level of governance and i can tell you that funding no doubt the biggest issue that young people face in um continuing their advocacy on a long term level if we want to create that long term change which gender equality is all about gender equality isn't a short term goal it's a long term change and it's going to require a lot of commitment um and that funding element is often missing um especially within youth led advocacy and youth led movements i think that there fundamentally needs to be some sort of long term strategy and approach towards creating access to funding but also access to opportunity and upskilling for young people to continue their advocacy mm -hmm. on the grassroots levels um i upon working at an international level i found that grassroots advocacy fundamentally will be the leading um and driving momentum to creating that gender equality advocacy that we are after and i think that it is fundamental to explore how international organizations and major organizations that have so much power and influence can collectively work with grassroots organizations that are led by underrepresented minorities and constituents to continue that um advocacy on a long term basis so yeah. for me i know i've struggled with funding i know i've struggled with access to opportunity and especially upskilling um you can't just provide young people with um opportunities if you're not upskilling them to absolutely exploit that opportunity and i'm going to use the big e word we got to exploit that opportunity because if we do not exploit that opportunity that opportunity will go to waste um so i think both go hand in hand with each other and we need to explore how we can work with these grassroots advocates to create that change together I think what I would add to that um is uh, my challenge would be uh the tracking of that um because what I'm finding is that there are uh lots of uh initiatives that happen uh lots of spaces that are opened up um and but they still seem to be one off opportunities or a series of events mm -hmm. that is uh based around a theme um but then what is happening is that there's no tracking of that um and I certainly um uh, you know as a backbencher in the Scottish Parliament it's one of the questions that I always ask is how are you tracking that progress um what are the the measurable outcomes um that you're uh, achieving here you know what does success look like um because sometimes what i do find and this is a wee bit of cynicism that creeps into me is that uh, there are lots of saviors around um and they sort of create opportunities uh you know create spaces it makes them feel good and it's job done um and governments can do that as well you know when you're challenged on sort of race equality or gender equality it's all well we've got this policy we've got that policy but what happens next it's the execution of that policy how does that policy actually filter down what is the impact of it what is the change in people's life experiences and that can be uh you know the qualitative and the quantitative data it needs to be collected and then i think that that would help to maybe secure that funding a little bit more as well because that leads into accountability um maybe you know uh, th that that is my challenge to actually any organization um but also you know generations working together i'm sure are you know doing their absolute part in that but we can always push people further um 
So as we come towards the end um, of this chat, we've explored so many themes, um, but we can't get away from the ageism uh, one. Uh, we in Scotland at the moment have uh, local authority elections uh, coming up and we've had uh, a number of candidates uh, that are quite youthful. Um, and they've been selected and there's been a bit of a backlash in the press about the, the lack of life experience um, and the fact that they've not had a real job or, you know, done anything and how do they think that they can be elected representatives. Now, I have my views about that. I'd be interested to hear what your views are on that, Zara. Yeah. Look, I think especially as a young woman, I have faced my fair share of scrutiny. I have faced my fair share of questions um, and have definitely faced with that opposing element of imposter syndrome. So it is quite a challenge for myself. Um, I... Last year, at the end of last year, I did actually run for my um, president of my university and I faced quite a lot of harsh criticism, not only for my age, but also for my identity as a Muslim woman. Um, I was consistently branded as a um, angry Muslim young advocate who is trying so hard to be a feminist. Um, and, you know, it does definitely get to you on a mental note, but I think that it needs to be done. And if we're going to talk about how change hope happens, you got to start having that slow representation. And I think that you're a clear testament of that. Um, you embody and you absolutely epitomize what will slowly happen in terms of representation over time. And until we consistently start to normalize and change the trajectory of what you know, a diverse uh, level of leadership and governance looks like. Um, we can't, you know, stop and cease the opportunities that we have to be a part of that trajectory of change as well. And I think that if I'm going to cop it um, for the future generations, then so be it, as long as we're slowly working together to create that change. Um, if not me, who else? And I consistently ask myself that. And I consistently always remind myself that, you know, there has to be someone. This is the way that change is going to happen. Dialogue, storytelling, and, you know, may as well be about me. <laughs> absolutely. And it should be absolutely about yourself. I'm going to reframe um, what you were maybe perceived or labelled as um, into uh, a young, intelligent, articulate advocate um, for intersection uh, intersectionality um, on equality. Actually, that's how I see you as. Um, so that's the other way of looking at it. And that's the way I will look at it. Um, ageism, it's a funny thing, um, especially in sort of uh, represented uh, positions and elected positions. It's not something that men suffer from, is it? I mean, if you look at the average age of uh, parliamentarians, um, as well as the co uh, colour and the gender, then it is predominantly uh, dominated by uh, white uh, elder men. Um, and I suppose the systems that certainly uh, here, uh, they were created by those people. So the rules uh, were created by them, not for the likes of me, I suppose. So it's even harder to, to break through that. Um, from my point of view, I just think that, you know, uh, the intersectionality bit um, is just so important to emphasize. So we're looking at gender equality, we're looking at race coming into that, and then also age coming into that as well. And we've already talked a, a lot about how bringing all of those things together um, I think that that is the volcano that erupts into something that is incredibly positive. And, you know, that lava of hope can encompass everything and sort of, you know, crack the surfaces that it covers, but then sort of reinvigorate and reignite a different way of working, that synergy that can happen. Um, I mean, I certainly enjoy, uh, you know, as an educationist, I'm quite used to sort of uh, communicating with and working alongside young people. I get a lot of drive and energy, but I also get pushed by them. I get asked difficult questions. Um, you know, somebody like Greta Thunberg, who, you know, sort of annoys so many people. And I think, well, quite right, because actually without annoying people, um, how do you break that chain? You know, how do you get people to think differently? Um, it's not by behaving well. 
it is by asking the difficult questions. Um, and whereas somebody like me who can get very tired um, and sometimes lose that inspiration and then to get buoyed up and get challenged, I think quite right, you know, in that sense. But I'm also finding that younger women are coming to me and they are listening to and valuing my experiences and learning from maybe the the rocky roads and the the paths of you know I can say don't do that you know I tried that it didn't work um and hopefully I'm giving them a few shortcuts so that we don't you know hopefully we can achieve gender equality a lot sooner than what the stats are showing us but I have no doubt that you know people like yourself um, and me I'll put myself in there as well it may as well be, be about the both of us <laughs> I'm sure that we can, um, you know, keep going. Um, Zara, it's been absolutely wonderful to uh, speak to you. Um, and I hope that the people who are listening um, and watching, um, it's given them a lot of food for thought and inspired some questions um, and how they're going to change their behaviours and change their views and do things differently. I know there are things that I've learned from you that will make me think differently um so have you got something to say to the audiences as a as a farewell message yeah look i just want to push on the message that everyone listening should absolutely take up space take up space wherever you go and share your story but also remember that not not everyone is um deserving to hear your story recognize that your voice is a part of that revolution and we all share our part in creating the movement for gender equality and creating that room for every single one of us to be a part of that revolution. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, I really, really do appreciate it. And I think that you are an absolutely major inspiration for so many young women of colour like myself. So, um, so much love from Australia to you and hopefully together we will build a future that is representative of every single intersectional voice across the world. Thank you, Zara, and it is absolutely reciprocated from uh, Scotland and uh, sunny Glasgow here as well, um, sending you much love on this um, International Women's Day on um, building gender equality for sustainability. Um, and that's what it's all about. It, it's not just one off uh, wee pockets of success, um, but it's about building that sustainability to the benefit of uh, all of us. Um, and I would like to, on behalf of both of us, I'd like to thank uh, Generations Working Together for bringing us together. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. That was such a pleasure listening to both of you and I'm sure our audience is going to absolutely love it. Um, so interesting. Um, CoCab, um, Zara, thank you so, so, so much. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll finish it there, but we'll, well, I'm sure Kate will be in touch. Okay, I hope that was you. Zara, it was so lovely to meet you. I'd love to sort of like, you know, um, you've got my contact details, so please do keep in touch. Um, and if there is anything that I can help with, I'd be delighted. And, you know, if you come over, um, I would be more than happy to welcome you to the Scottish Parliament and, uh, you know, sort of show you the chamber and do the VIP tour. So you would be more than welcome um, to, to do that at any time. <laughs> yeah. and Thank I'm sure so that's wonderful. Yeah, and I'm sure Kate will be in touch because it would be really great to keep in touch with you to see if there's more that we can actually do. Can you actually hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. you can. Yeah. Um, so that so that there is, you know, so so that this is this is a dialogue that we want to continue. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, we will definitely be in touch. Kate will be in touch. But thank you very much, the two of you, for today. Thank you. That's brilliant. Okay, um, it, it almost is a bit difficult to know how to even kind of carry on that conversation, but I think something that struck me there was just how important it is to continue it. Um, so I think Kate's just um, invited some questions and thoughts from the conversation. Um, and what I could do is really, I mean, I, I've, there's almost so much there. I've written my own notes to kind of mull them over and take them away with me. But 
um, if it's a helpful starting point, I see a couple of comments that I'll maybe come back to from the chat, um, but certainly some of the themes, even if you're to pick out words that really stood out there to me, um, was just, like, I think you used the word pleasure, Alison, but I think just seeing the connection between two people that hadn't met, but felt they'd so much difference but yet things in common and I suppose that's something that we, we all can probably relate to in some form or other but I think barriers was something that was you know obviously spoken about in the beginning about that multi-level experience of that from the grassroots and every day right up to the higher kind of levels of leadership and, and governments but I think that sort of um, what I've written here is paved the way just I think when Zara was talking about honouring I guess her knowledge and experience of the you know the women that have gone before her and also that you know are older than her that she's are still in her life that actually um I guess passed down their experience and paved the way for you know I guess so that we don't have to that she doesn't have to wait I suppose that was the bit that um you know they speak up and we should speak up so that others don't have to wait 21 years that I think um Koka was talking about you know um there's so much there but I suppose exhaustion I suppose we were talking about the difference of experience and I guess the length of time that people might have been you know obviously speaking out and representing um different experiences was just actually how energizing it can be to have an intergenerational connection that allows I guess, energy and experience to be shared, but bolstered. I think there was something about um, bolstering that power and innovation to purely challenging each other and knowing that you're on, you know, the same page while also bringing something very different. So, um, yeah, so much. What are the pressure points we could be pressing? So it's that sort of self-challenge of what could we be doing? Um and stories I suppose there was a lot there wasn't there about creating space and um, holding space and inviting stories and making sure there's room for everyone in that especially underrepresented groups which I think Zara pointed to quite a few times and um, and it was lovely at the end I think to see um, Cockab reframe a narrative that obviously was set for for um, Zara of you know how people saw her or how she felt people saw her um, and I think to be able to set to reframe that narrative is a really powerful thing through one even just one conversation um, I think because so many narratives stick that actually aren't ours to hold um, so, so 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 much there and I guess the thing that I really wanted to open out whether people have thoughts on that now or that you know you can bring back to us I think is GWT is you know that question of how do we make this more than an initiative or more than a one-off and I suppose that's something I want to take away um, for us all I think um, to really question um, and I think as well, listening more loudly, that will stick with me because I think there's so much we need to listen to in terms of the barriers faced by women. Um, I think, you know, by many, I think it's that intersectional thing, whether it's race, whether it's age, um, whether it's life experience and lived experience, um, what are the barriers that are faced that we need to listen to? What expertise um, and skill do we need to honor and, and welcome and usher and advocate for? Um, and what bias do we need to listen to you know um, so so much that I think I'd love to see and I'm excited from listening to that in terms of how do we make this never a one and done this is something that I think we could be um, exploring a lot more with um, intergenerational strength in mind um, and I do see just pointing to the chat um, I think there was a question from Lorraine on what work can we be doing with boys and men to support women in this journey which I think is such an important question to ask um, and you know I think that's something to hold on to I think in terms of where we can, might take that because I think that the question was made that it's a stronger world and a more representative world for everyone when we actually address the ceilings and the walls and the doors that are faced for women I think at that point even when I came in what I was really interested in was just that I'm struck so much today about the influence on women and all women and um, but men are a huge part of that right and it's how do we take on board cockabs you know um, 
what she calls an educationalist approach of like, who do we start these conversations with our um our little ones and our, you know, around just actually honoring what they the challenge they bring and how we challenge them and foster them. So um I think that's something to hold on to. And talking, yeah, Kate, you've said talking about intersectionality more, but still not enough. I mean, I definitely hear it talked about a lot more. And I think it is very much about not just words. And I, but it can feel quite overwhelming, I think, sometimes when you're aware of where do you start. And I think that's something that um please do share your thoughts. Um uh yeah, so I suppose there's different ways we can do that. So um I might invite that um from Kate or Allison in terms of how we continue this conversation. I'm not sure there will be, I'm sure, evaluations and things as well, but it's just lots of opportunities to do that. And a wee reminder, this is we've still got day three and day four um of uh, the conference. So it's just a wee prompt um for folks for that. Um and also that it's internet it's it's still intergenerational women or international women's uh, day for another number of hours and it's quite telling actually that Zara's probably in the middle of the night and we're still talking about the words that she shared with us so when we go to bed there'll still be women celebrating this day and men celebrating this day so um please do keep um uh, tweeting um and talking about this um so I'm just going to hand over maybe Kate um, and Alison if there's anything else you'd like to share. Yeah, yeah, I, I wrote like so many notes uh, <laughs> to myself, literally kind of pages and pages. Uh, I've met both of the speakers kind of individually to try and get them to do this conversation. And in my head, you know, the way I, I saw it, this was so much better. Uh, and I felt like they really got on and they got a lot from each other and they really complimented each other really well. One big thing that I got out of the conversation is, uh, you know, we can't really have uh, equality without grassroots element to this. Uh, and we also can't have laws, you know, if laws don't actually make a difference in the ground. So that's really powerful. It's not enough to have that conversation. We need to actually make sure we take action and we need to make sure that we're involving women who we might not typically see, you know, even when we look at social media during Women's Day. And I think uh, Zara's mentioned her disappointment, you know, even though there's so much, uh, she's still not seeing quite the representation she thinks there should be. And Kokab mentioning as well that, you know, she didn't think she would have to be the woman kind of standing but she almost felt like she had to, you know, to try and uh, open that door even a little bit. So um, that was that was interesting to me, but also, uh, I guess, disheartening as well, because, you know, we realize there's still so much work to do. And the part of the conversation when they really talked about, you know, there'll be 99 years or so before we get to gender equality, that's that's very far away, considering that the first International Women's Day is 111 years ago. You know, so uh, mm -hmm. it's an ongoing and long term work and it kind of takes all of us uh, to start making a difference for there to be a bigger difference. Um, mm -hmm. I just wonder, Kate, as well, like I think, you know, it's I think because it can feel quite um, overwhelming. Sometimes you're a bit like, where do I start? And I think, you know, from doing a wee bit of um, just exploration and educating myself I think on what their backgrounds have been I think what I like that Zara calls herself um, a vocalist for change you know we can use our voices in everyday ways I think there's you know and I really love that Generations Working Together talks about what does that look like in our families and our communities and our workplaces in every day and I think it's the same in terms of what do we need to respect and see and address in terms of equality and intersectionality in our work places in our everyday conversations it doesn't have to be these huge things they're actually just that everyday leadership and again one of the things that struck was when one of um Zara's previous um sort of presentations or speeches was future you know they talk often about young people about being future leaders and but actually you know we could, they could be present and we could be present leaders Do you know there's something about and there was that in that discussion about the, the present and addressing the present and actually what we can do in those moments so um so so much there 
and I think so much to be sharing in this group. I don't know everyone who's in in the chat, um, but I can see already, um, Louine, you've, you're passing on your own knowledge of um, some some work around um, education with men and boys. So there's so much that we could be sharing with each other. I suppose it's just encouraging us to be able to find spaces and continue to protect those spaces to do it. Um, so yeah, lots and lots of thoughts. Um, can, can I just can I just say two things? Um, it, it was an absolute pleasure this morning to actually just sit and not actually have to do anything and just sit and listen to CoCab. They they were absolutely and, and watching it twice. That's me sat through it twice. Um, and I, I think I enjoyed it better the second time. Um, I, I think they were totally inspiring. I think what got me was this was a, a very although Kate had spoken to the two of them this was a very last minute thing so they just came together we, we basically just spoke for five minutes and through that 50 minutes I could see how that relationship between the two of them was actually developing and they actually gave quite a lot of personal detail because it was as if they were talking to one another when, when we were when we were doing this and it made me really think about how could we be doing that more in the community if we think about what uh, CoCab was saying about local councillors and the backlash of younger people you know how did they have that experience could the could the older members of the, the local council be coming and working with them is just, just so many ways that we could be holding that conversation um, mm -hmm. but I certainly think for GWT it certainly made me think about some of the things that we probably don't do very much at the moment that we could be doing more and, and it showed you the power of just two people having that connection um, and, and at the very end we spoke for a couple of minutes after the cameras went off and you could see how friendly the two of them had become um, so that that to me was just absolutely amazing it kind of blew me blew me away so um, it really does inter, intergenerational work is just uh, it's a really impactful thing I also think we need to talk more about intersection and intersectionality because it's a word that's just some people might have heard it for a while but in my sphere it's just really came in in the last maybe year um, so I think we need to talk about that and we need to explain what it actually is so that people who maybe haven't heard it are not quite as fair with it and are able to join that conversation as well. Yeah absolutely I think there's something about that um words can mean you know that we do use words sometimes without really unpacking you know what do we mean by that and how do we make that real and actually how do we affirm actually what we're trying to do already do you know and I still remember that when I was trying to you know really deeply understand what intergenerational means do you know and actually what do we mean by that we can mean very many different things depending on what we bring to that word do you know but I think in terms of honor and what intersectionality really I think it um the, the phrase was used multiple identities and actually acknowledging that that is is really important even to just not assume and not um I guess you know you're creating space for that and, and acceptance um as well as celebration of it um but yeah um how much time have we got? I think we've got till 8.15, but I see there's, you know, oh, there's some some more messages um, coming in, but we quote here, um, yeah, from Inez McCormack, it is not comfortable to be the first woman of anything, but from her story and others, it can be small and still powerful, you know, and I think that, you know, that is something about language and actually what that means and how people set their own narrative of what they actually are there to represent is so important. Um, multiple identities, seven the play, um, making rights real. Yeah. So what is also interesting, um, Jude, is, is we do have a, a male in the audience. I, I, I don't want to, to put him on the spot, but I just wondered if he wanted to say anything um, about his experience of being here tonight. Don't know if he wants to put anything in the chat. Well, maybe we need to give him a couple of minutes to have a wee think about it. It's actually quite hard. I'm trying to, to look through the, the chat, but I keep missing bits because it kind of jumps for me. But um, There's one there, making real rights are looking for women, including those often not sharing their voices, noting interest in the Scottish version of the Place 7. 
which I think would be all the richer with an intergenerational lens. That's from Lorreen. Oh, that's great. Um, and it's quite, I know, I think we need to acknowledge, obviously, that um, a kind of natural barrier we have is that this is a dialogue. And obviously, we have to, to kind of, you know, state that we know that we're, we're having a dialogue with you through a chat. Um, so I suppose this is just the beginning, you know, and I suppose hopefully there'll be more spaces where we can actually see each other face to face to be able to have fuller conversations around this. So I'm um, very much excited that, you know, this, this um, will continue. Um, and I think maybe open out some of those themes and questions that, you know, you were mentioning, Lorena, about, you know, how do we, I guess the gender diversity, do you know, that we bring all perspectives um, and all the nuances of that into, into the conversation. Um, there's, a, there's also another one there from Louise Peach. She says, this, this was a fan fascinating conversation, a great example of intergenerational dialogue to address issues around intersectionality and equality that include gender, race and age. She thanks us. Just thinking about the on the ground, I think it's also important to recognise intergenerational practice. Work is also feminist. Work is also feminist issue considering that education and care sectors are large employers of women and often involve informal care work, often carried out by women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, certainly that struck me, I think, in terms of, you know, social work being a very female dominated profession and social care, obviously, is, is you know, is as well. And it's just actually something to celebrate in terms of what, you know, what is offered there, but equally all the challenge and actually, you know, the, the multiple that, you know, and I've seen lots in terms of like the gender pay gap and lots of different things. And I suppose, you know, you hear these conversations um, rotating over time you know and change happening but um how do we challenge that because it's very much an intergenerational thing when we think about the the caring responsibilities that are often experienced by women um who are trying to you know hold down you know Im important and really necessary employment while also having really important caring roles um, and offering so much in so many different directions um so huge amount I think they're a really rich conversation and rich questions and I suppose that was something I thought this was question based but it was very much a conversation and I suppose what I liked is that this was actually not about coming with answers or you know sound bites or you know this was about how do we keep creating space for questions where we can learn more and just challenge each other more because we're all the better for it so um yeah it's been a real privilege we do have a we do have a response from Ross. I, I will I will name him now that he's given <laughs> us a response. Thank you, Ross. He says hello all. It's been really fascinating to listen to everyone share their experience. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, he was saying that he thinks it's really important for men to listen as much as possible and find ways to actively loudly support the causes involved in. Um, intergenerational women's day feminism and intersectionality in general there is nothing for men to be afraid of or be threatened by thank you ross that's great thank you yeah i mean i thought it was great you know i i'm quite a quiet person and this is <laughs> so it's quite interesting to actually be part of a conversation that's been talking very much about how to be listening loudly and speak widely to know and I think both of those things are really great to exercise <laughs> and celebrate other people's opportunities to exercise that too um but yeah so we've got one more here yeah lots more here I'm wondering actually how we collect some of this Alice in terms of some of the suggestions here um particularly grassroots organizations here and suggestions about different ways to carry on this conversation that we take note of and actually we maybe can share with people yeah, we, we absolutely can share the, the chat with people as well. That's brilliant. Um, well, I suppose just in, in finishing up, unless there's anything else, we just want to thank everybody for their time tonight. Um, I know it's an evening event that we've had, um, which is maybe something a little newer as well, but we really appreciate people taking time out of their evenings to, to be part of this and hopefully help us carry on. 
Uh, so again, thanks again, and please pass on any thoughts um, that you have afterwards. And please, you know, if you can come along to some of our, our next events. And I did touch on it earlier, but it was really just a reminder that we do have intergenerational week coming up. Um, so please look out for any kind of signs to share around that. Um, again, for, for uh, I guess, just that the intergenerational conversation continues to. Uh, so yeah, thank you. And lovely to see the diversity of people in, in Scotland and where they're coming from today as well. That, that's also that and some of the intros. So we've come from lots of different corners of Scotland uh, too. And thanks for that, those links in the chat. Okay, we'll have a lovely evening, everybody. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you for coming. Bye. 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 Bye.